Um, uh, got it. So today's call, we've got Izzy from the CAS, who is in Goma, um, talking to us about um, what is the Manito and so how we track evidence um, in public health emergencies. Izzy, over to you. Great. Um, thank you, Simone. Um, as, uh, yeah, as she said, so I'm a field supervisor for the CAS um, working in the DRC. So I'm going to talk today about how we support and monitor the use of evidence uh, by public health emergency response actors, and in doing so, how we measure our own impact as part of a response network as well. Um, so I'm assuming most people know about the CAS, but just as a sort of summary anyway. So we're comprised of two field teams in the DRC. So one is based in Kinshasa and the other one in Goma. So the Kinshasa team kind of covers the West and the, a bit of the center and Goma, mostly the East. And we do have increasing capacity to travel to the provinces and other areas of the country as well uh, in response to alerts. And in these cases, we, we recruit our local teams to carry out and support the research. So just briefly, the objectives of the CAS. So we conduct rapid studies to better understand the dynamics of epidemics, um, provide near to real-time data to inform decision-making on epidemic responses, help different actors to use data and co-develop the actions. So this is mostly what this presentation will be about today. We create a space for integrated analysis of epidemics. So bringing together different data sources to, to better understand the uh, epidemic dynamics and public health outcomes. And then in doing so, we in doing all of this, we're training national researchers and uh, developing relationships with national institutions. Okay, so the CAS, basically the reason for us existing is to facilitate evidence-based decision-making. So it's really a a bottom-up approach we, we use to improve the likelihood of programs actually working and having an impact. So defined around how the results can be used and, and by whom. So basically, if we can't see the data that we generate being used or usable, then we won't conduct the research. So the evidence that we are generating the research we're doing is generally for government, so lots of the Ministry of Health, um, academic institutions, um, NGOs, international, national, local level, and then donors and, and program funders as well. So in terms of, of using evidence, basically it's not, it's not enough to just talk about using evidence for programs, but also when we use it to influence funding, policy, strategy, etc. And so it might be that for different disease outbreaks as well, or different public health emergencies, um, recommendations for evidence use may fall into, into more of one category than another. So here I've got three examples. So strategic uh, uses for evidence might be when new programs or interventions are developed. So this for so COVID is a really good example of this. Um, a lot of the, the recommendations of the evidence that we've generated through our research on COVID has, has pointed to kind of long-term needs, uh, strategic uses of evidence. So things to do with the impact of the school closures, for example, or the socioeconomic impacts of the COVID response on women and girls. Um, but yeah, so for example here as well, like developing a new strategy for implementation of family program, uh, family planning programs in new areas um, and that kind of thing. And then we've got on the intervention level, so Ebola is a really good example of, of the kind of, um, the kind of uh, evidence we generate uh, during the work we were doing in the East. Um, and then more recently in Eteria looking at, at bubonic plague as well. And the recommendations, for example, like um, changing communication tools, how they look, who they're, who they're targeted at, that, that kind of thing. And then also different, perhaps different training needs for healthcare workers. And then a final use also then is looking, is using data for and evidence for advocacy purposes. So um, yeah, using it to apply for funds um, with partners with um, other actors with UNICEF, for example, from in our, in our case. Um, okay, so how do we, facilitate the use of data. So essentially, when we're conducting research, we need to ensure that others are involved in the design, which probably sounds like a bit of a no-brainer. Um, so this means that 
those who should use the data. So um, this can be yeah, stakeholders in a, in a in the specific field, so response actors. Um, depending on the on the public health emergency as well, it could be um, the clusters or intervention committees as well. And then stakeholders with specific issues to address. This is where we work a lot on kind of relationship building and making sure that we have close contacts with people in different organizations who will, in theory, if we've got these good relationships, be very transparent about what their what their kind of research and data needs are. Second point here is that we need to address the questions and information that's required by the stakeholders. So this involves regular communication and feedback. So they can check that the data that we're providing kind of in real time is useful to them. And then we ourselves need to take the time to ask how and what will this data be useful? Because again, from, from previous slides, there's no point, we won't conduct the, the research unless we can actually see the data being used for something. So this then links to the, the benefit of co-development. So if we're talking about recommendations and co-development of recommendations, that the more involved any actor is uh, in the whole process, basically, the more invested they will be in using the data to influence um, their decision making. So, yeah, so we encourage the use of evidence through the co-development of recommendations. Um, so these, this is kind of just um, another summary of the, of the previous slide, but we might look at, um, at issues that are raised through the epidemiological situation, specific requests from commissions or actors, uh, data that exists that points to a problem or, or just the, the context of a public health emergency. This will then lead to the research question. And then from there, terms of reference, so um, what are the study objectives? How will the data be used? Again, the key point, how will it be used? Will it be usable? And then the methodology, so how will we go about addressing the question? So then the study will be validated by coordination, commission actors, et cetera. So we'll share the terms of reference, we'll share the research tools, and that's also where we'll be um, requesting input for, um, for uh, any questions, any things they want to be included in the in the research tools. And then the data collection phase. So from, from our side, this will be our um, our research teams that we have in Kinshasa and Goma and more remote um, going and actually yeah collecting data in the field. And then the process of analysis, so um, IOA, um, where we're going to bring together data from different sources, analyze it together. And then this facilitates the development of recommendations, which the fact that we're using all these, we've integrated all of these different data sources means that we're more confident and that we can, we can communicate with more confidence the analysis and the evidence um, with which to develop the recommendations and to suggest they're actually a reflection of reality. Um, okay, so just to look at the co-development and monitoring process, so when, for the, the firstly after analysis, again, it's a slight repetition of the previous slides, but it's quite important just to, so that you can kind of visualize the process. Um, so we'll present the results of the initial analysis to the, to the research team. So does the analysis that we've done reflect the reality? How can it be interpreted? For, and, and then what might be the limitations? So we ourselves internally will look at the analysis and, and in advance of communicating with um, uh, of presenting, however we go about presenting it, uh, we can have an idea of what it might mean and, and where we think we could go with it. Um, we then, yeah, initially we'll present the results to the Ministry of Health Management. This is really for validation and feedback. So normally this will be this will be a full presentation of results. This can be a very long process because often, especially for our um, like CAP surveys, we'll have a hundred slides, and so trying to get uh, a room of, of people from the Ministry of Health to sit through 100 slides can be quite uh, taxing, um, but it's, it's necessary given the, um, the relationship that we have with them. Um, then internally, again, we'll look at validation and modification of the presentation, so for, for different actors, depending on, on their needs. And then when it comes to the actual presentation of the results, 
we will reach out to the response actors or to the stakeholders in a particular area and we will present to them whether that's a presentation with a powerpoint whether it's say sit down around the table with three people and discussing the results on, on a one side piece of paper this is where we sit and we have the we have the conversations which lead to the development of recommendations actions indicators time the timeline for implementation as well after that next phase is to integrate the recommendations that we've developed into our monitoring tool the mini so i'll cover this in a moment and this is what we then use to influence response strategies and, and um, approaches okay so the monito um you might have heard of the Minita before. Essentially, it's a tool developed by, uh, by the CAS to track the use of evidence. Um, not quite sure where the name Monito came from, but I think it probably is monitoring tool, which does make sense. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's a nice name, I think. Um, anyway, so social scientists, as I'm sure we're all aware and probably a part of this as well, frequently complain about no one really understanding the value of their work or using their data. And this is something that was very common during the, the Ebola response in the East, uh, 2018 to 2020. And I mean, in fact, it wasn't just social sciences data, but, but any data really like decisions, uh, decisions were kind of clearly being made without using much of the evidence that was available. So just as a brief, as a brief history of the CAS, I mean, it was, uh, sorry, the CAS of uh, the Minito, is that it was developed during, yeah, during the East African, the East Congo Ebola response, uh, in response to the, to address the issue of data that wasn't being used. Um, so identifying this problem and uh, that it was very much an unmet need. So I wasn't actually working for the CAS at the time, but so Simone can very much fill in the gaps um, if there are particular questions. Um, but broadly as well, I mean, we've all read and we've written countless reports and presentations which include recommendations based on data that's uh, that's presented in these reports or presentations, but there's there's very rarely a, a, a structure or a plan for implementation. So putting these recommendations actually into action, um, which can then just leave a lot of data and evidence that's been generated by research just unused. So this is where the Manito comes into play, um, which. So yeah, it's, it's an online tool. It's a essentially an Excel spreadsheet which was developed by the CAS to monitor the use of evidence. And it can also help response actors to do, or what it essentially does is response, help response actors to do what they say they will do and when they, when they say they'll do it. Um, and it's, I mean, it's generally something, it's something very different and, and I think special, like really special about the CAS that we were co-developing the recommendations. We don't just, we don't just leave them to the response actor to um, put them on a report and put them in a drawer and not um, have nothing done with them. So we actually work with them using this tool to make sure that they can actually put them into practice. And even just personally, when when I'm out with, if I'm out talking to friends or family about what, what I'm doing and I'm talking about the cast and how we work very animatedly. And I mean, the bit that really gets them kind of sitting up and listening is, is this process of monitoring the implementation of agreed actions so just making sure that our research and the data and evidence of others is actually is actually being used and also i mean we see this as, as kind of it's, it's ethically we can't really justify doing operational research without having a minito um okay so the purpose of the minito anyway we have um we have one on a local and a, uh, our local teams have, have them and then we also have a, a global one. So it's a tool that compiles recommendations that are co-developed. It follows up on the consideration and implementation of recommendations by partners um, and by the partners we've presented to. It's used to document the work of the CAS with the partners. So when was the presentation? Who was there? Where was it? Uh, what was discussed, what was uh, what was recommended for action. It also just broadly contributes to measuring the impact of social science research on response interventions. Um, and in terms of what we're recording with it, so it 
by by different health emergency, by area of intervention, by the time period, the study, the origin, the theme. We're looking at the status of implementation. So has it been implemented? Uh, has it been, is it delayed? Has it been abandoned? If it's been abandoned or delayed, what are the reasons? Indicators for monitoring the progress. Narrative process of implementation. So this is, this is rather than a, um, has it been implemented? Has it, is, has it, has it not? Or it's, um, or the detail of the, of the recommendation. It's, it's kind of how, specifically how the response actor will go about putting this into practice. So it, it's kind of, it means this, this, having this on the Amanita really encourages us to, and our teams when we're in discussion with, uh, with anyone, with, an, with a response partner, to make sure that they can really visualize how they can actually do it. So what do they need? Um, who do they need to be there? When do they need it by that kind of thing? Um, and then again, yeah, looking at the requirements for implementation. So it's just, this is this is similar as well. So when we first have a meeting with, um, or when we're first doing a presentation, we'll have the requirements uh, for the implementation, which will be initially identified. But then, if, for example, we have to go back to the partner when we're following up, and and they say they haven't been able to do something, or there's a delay, then we might need to say, okay, well, what what are you missing? What uh, what needs to be um, what needs to be changed or adapted? How do we? Uh, how can we prevent the prevent further delay or help you implement what you said you will implement? And then again, yeah, the uh, agreed timeline for achieving the objectives. Um, and since June 2020, um, this is just a, a bit of a summary of the of where we are with the recommendations we've been um, co-developing. So we're currently working um, COVID, Ebola, uh, sexual violence malnutrition, plague, and cholera with a total of 237 recommendations. So some of these have been already implemented. Um, most we're, we're monitoring the progress at the moment. Um, and yeah, just to say that also during um, Ebola 2018-2020, we uh, co-developed 112 uh, recommendations in total then. Um, okay, so the for the co-development stage of the process, um, this is another tool which um, I'll try not to make it sound like it's more complicated than it actually is. Um, the monitito, the baby monitor, um, is what we take when we present the results to um, uh, to a to a different um, partner, potential partner, response actor. This might also be, we might be presenting, especially with COVID remotely, and so we'll have a monitor in front of us and just be um, compiling the, the data or the information. Um, but essentially it's a, yeah, the, it's a couple of pages of a, of a Word document um, where we fill in the information which will then get put into the Manito. So it, it covers uh, who was there, what was discussed, um, what were the issues that were, that resonated with, um, uh, during during the meeting, recommendations that were developed, actions, etc. So all of the details that that the that were just covered during the during the meeting. But one of the things that's really important um, that we have that we actually have quite a few problems with this with our newer teams at the moment is making sure that the the objectives of the presentation are um, when we're presenting the the evidence that the objectives are really well lined out because. Um, so if we're doing a presentation and the objective at the end is to develop recommendations, um, we need to make it very clear because frequently we'll have, we'll conduct a, uh, we'll do a presentation and then there'll be people getting stuck on the methods or saying that we pass through the methodology too quickly and they, they pick apart the small things that aren't really the, uh, that aren't the objective of the, of the presentation. And especially, you know, if we've, if we've only got 15 minutes to present something, it can be a real pain um, because then we have to go back and do it again or yeah and and it I think I think with like with time and with uh, with kind of trust of what we're doing and our work this is something I think during Ebola was 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 easier because CAS was established in one place with the same kind of groups of people the same organizations very um, had a lot of, of uh, a lot of exposure whereas now Whereas where we have to be doing things a lot more remotely, like pushing up, like advocating for our 
for our presence makes it a bit more difficult, but um, the pressure of, of having to explain always justify how we're doing things, the methodology is quite difficult. So we're, we're getting there, but it's taking a bit of time. Um, but yeah, so the, that kind of links to the, the really insisting on making time for decision making. So if somebody says, okay, you have 10 minutes to present, then we need to insist for 15, 20, ideally 30, because it's just not enough time to, to, to cover the, the results and, and the discuss the next steps, basically. We also then, so we, we also share suggestions of action. So um, our teams will sit down prior to the um, uh, prior to the meeting, prior to the presentation, and we'll say, okay, with the with the results we have for this actor, what do we reckon might be relevant to them? We won't then go and say and have developed the recommendations ourselves and then convince them to do them, but it's kind of just a, to point them in the in what we hope might be the right direction. Um, and then, yeah, looking at, at uh, options of what has been done or agreed during previous presentations. Um, okay, so here's just an example of what the mini actually looks like. So it's, I mean, it's, it's an Excel uh, table, as you can see. Um, just highlighting a few of the points there. So um, we will, yeah, cover the area. So which area does the recommendation apply? Is it only applicable to a specific area or all affected areas? So, sorry, hang on. Um, for example, when um, Ebola came to Bandaka in, in so the west of the DRC in, in 2020, some recommendations from the eastern outbreak were implemented um, because these may have been recommendations that during the eastern outbreak um, came the the, the issues arose in, in multiple different areas. So we thought, okay, well, there's, a, there's a, a strong likelihood that they will be relevant to maybe not all Ebola outbreaks, but it's something that's worth trying. But there are others that may have been specific to particular locations. So without further research, we, uh, we didn't push to implement the recommendations. Um, also then we'll look at the study or the source of the, of the recommendations. So this is important for when we're trying to document the impacts of a study or a recurring theme. And then looking at who's responsible for the implementation. So in this, this is the kind of overall global Manito we have, which doesn't have a lot of detail here because it's it's open for people to see. And so um, in the local, the, the sort of more zone specific ones, um, we, and also in the Monotitos, we will store specific contact details, um, names of individuals, et cetera. Um, and then I know it's very small, but just to um, show it as well, a couple of other bits. So the origin of the recommendation. So was it developed in real time during or post presentation? Did it come from existing data as well? So this is interesting and, and really useful to consider is that um, we can try. We can try to avoid putting additional pressure on communities if we use existing data that, um, or recommendations that were developed previously. So, for example, in Butembo during the um, resurgence of Ebola earlier this year, we didn't actually collect any new data, um, but we pushed for use of uh, existing evidence. So, you know, we we decided not to collect more and realised there was enough and it was good enough quality. So from this 112 uh, recommendations that were that were co-developed during during Ebola in the East, um, and that wasn't without pressure from people saying, "Hey, Cass, come," um, which was nice to receive that pressure. But uh, you know, we had the humility to say, "Actually, no, we don't we don't need to go," uh, which they understood. Again, having allies was helpful because we had people there who had worked in the previous response and who knew the Cass, and so they trusted the work that we'd previously done. Um, looking at the justification of the uh, and the recommendation itself as well. So, what were the problems raised by the evidence and the actions agreed to address them? Then the concrete explanation of the action to be implemented. So, this is both for us, but also for the partner to remember to kind of really map out step by step how they will do what they uh, what they said they'll do in the recommendation. Um, and then indicators. Finally, so this is super important when uh, when we can have to allow us to decide whether or not a recommendation has been implemented. 
um, we have to make sure they're measurable, which is um, often a challenge. Um, okay, so Excel is great to use because we can make pivot tables and uh, view the data that we want to view and present the data that we want to view. So this is just looking at the um, status of implementation. So the state of progress of implementation of a, of a recommendation. Um, this is updated for each recommendation by the person in charge of the Manito. So according to the information received by um, his or her teams at the moment of me. Um, so when I have recommendations, um, we have recommendations made from a particular area um, and they'll be in the Manito and then on, in the recommender in the mini so they have the the date expected for follow up on these days I can then communicate with the team and ask for an update and then they will tell me an update and then I can include it in the global record uh, global mini -tour. um but yeah so just an example of, of some analysis just pulling out from that table so we can see that uh 54 percent of recommendations developed since that should actually say June not not April sorry uh have been completely applied. But then also something to bring up here is that 17% of recommendations made in Mandaka were abandoned. So why, why did this happen? So I can look at this and say, as an analysis, uh, yeah, what's, what's the reason? I mean, we're not in Bandaka anymore. UNICEF are not conducting a, um, a response to Ebola in Bandaka anymore. No one is. Um, so does this mean that people don't use evidence unless there's someone physically there to force them to do it? Um, but this is it. It's, it's we're using this data from the from the Manito, the information there, to to ask questions about uh, about the work um, that's being done. Um, here we can see the number of recommendations per quarter. So again, we're looking at um, so you can see the fifty four percent of recommendations since June. Also, uh, we're linked to the Ebola responses in Bandaka and in uh, Butembo. But only four recommendations developed for cholera um, and for a cholera response actors. So why, why so few? Because we have, it's not like we just started doing cholera research yesterday. It's been, it's been for at least six months. So does this mean then we can look at this and say, are our teams not presenting enough or are we presenting to the wrong people? So it's not relevant. Um, is the data not, um, not good enough quality? Uh, do people not trust it or is or is it just generally not useful so what can we learn from these numbers and adapt how can we adapt what we're doing uh, based on the figures presented in the mini two um okay so ensuring operationality of actions um all right so it's many to also help to identify and record challenges and restrictions to implementation so this could also be are they, are they operational? Um, so there might be questions like, why are some actions co-developed? Uh, why why are some, some recommendations implemented in others and not? Why are more developed by NGOs than UN, for example? So does this, um, is this because they, um, uh, or yeah, why, why maybe the NGOs implement actions more quickly um, than the UN? Um, as an example, or then why are more actions developed and implemented for certain uh, public health emergencies um, than others? So Ebola and plague, for example, it seemed much much easier to to uh, co-develop recommendations than it has been for COVID so far. And maybe this is maybe this is um, a result of the context as well, and the fact that since COVID, it's been very difficult to to meet people physically and to actually have discussions face to face and as good as zoom and, and teams can be it's it's not it's not quite the same um and yeah but so the role that then we can play is maybe it's maybe we need to then help to redefine the objectives of the action because maybe it's just not feasible um or also help to define the support that might be needed so is there additional money or, or hr or any logistical support that's needed and in general are we yeah, I mean, are we, are we co-developing actions and documenting them that are just ones that are not feasible for the actor to implement? So maybe they are too expensive, maybe they are too ambitious if we're just working with a with a um, a tiny NGO like small civil society group um, who might, for example, say, I and mean, we've had we've had numerous uh, examples of this, like the 
research team will come and, and share them on Etito that says it's with a very small organization of three people and they say, um, uh, you know, advocate for schools opening and that will be it rather than um, uh, any sort of detail of, of like, how can this actually happen? You know, that without an appreciation that they might need a bit more than just um, uh, their probably relatively small voice. Um, so yeah, it can also be used to highlight training needs for our team. Um, one of these would be to really emphasize the fact that actions need to be operational. So supporting uh, operational impact. Um, it's the responsibility of our teams to ensure that they will have an operational impact if they are properly implemented. So this is where it's really, really important that operational researchers, so if you're working for the CAS, have um, experience in programs and really understand programs. Because, um, yeah, often there's a lack of awareness of what can be done, what's possible to do in a response. So what are the kinds of actions that can be impl implemented to make the biggest difference to a response or address the real needs of, um, of communities? I just wanted to put this here because, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of personally a bit, uh, a bit tired of, of hearing that sensitization is the solution to, to all problems, basically, because everything tends to become the responsibility of communities to, to change their behavior, maybe because it costs less money up front, um, but it's, or maybe it might seem like it takes less time, but it's, it's not addressing the, the infrastructure or the, or the the health security issues that might have much longer term consequences and can lead, can lead to further outbreaks and that kind of thing. Um, so this is an example we're doing, we're starting next week some work in Neurogongo um, Health Area just outside or in, in Goma, um, looking at the impact of kind of a co-impact, hope possibly of um, the volcano erupting, which was in, in May and the third wave of COVID that seems to be hitting Goma pretty hard. And there are lots of messages that have been coming out really recently from the Ministry of Health saying, don't drink surface water, wash your food to get volcanic dust off your food because it's dangerous. But there's, there's no water in, in Neurogongo where the, you know, the people have a real, real issue accessing water. So they can't actually do, actually do this. The sensitization just doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Um, certainly not alone. Um, so yeah, so looking at the demonstration of the use of evidence. So it does depend on the outbreak and the structure of, of the response. So as I've kind of said a bit um, in previous slides, so there is some outbreaks, some public health emergencies, which where it's easier to demonstrate use of evidence. So those which are more heavily funded um, targeted responses. So for Ebola, for example, where everyone is in the same place uh, for the same reason. Um, um, Others also where actions developed might be much more tangible and, and easy to implement. So Ebola again, but also plague. Um, so not necessarily, it's not necessarily heavily funded, but the actions required are, uh, are relatively easy to implement. So this is just a picture of a, of a locally produced bed. That's one example of keeping children and women off the ground can prevent them from being bitten by fleas. People know that, um, but they don't have the means to construct or buy the beds. So again, sensitization. Um, local lab testing capacity, for example, this isn't in place in a tree, but it's relatively easy to implement and something that um, as of this month, I think actually as a result of our uh, as evidence that we generated during some uh, research back in May, uh, there is local lab capacity coming to uh, Bunya and Aturi, which is awesome. Um, and then also things like uh, protecting food by putting them in in sealed boxes in people's houses so people are aware that having food uncovered in their houses brings rats to their houses but they just don't have the means to protect them at the moment um so yeah easy responses with quick wins that have very big impact and then those which are much harder to demonstrate use so um this can be where Actions and interventions are a complex and, and multifaceted um, relate, you know, might be to do with uh, conflict or agriculture or, or gender. Um, they might be very poorly funded or, um, or poorly supported. Um, and then you've got COVID as a good example, ones with 
more mid to long term, so sort of might be direct or indirect impact. So it can be very difficult to convey and to convince the urgency of responding to these uh, to these impacts, maybe because the impacts haven't been seen yet or they're suspected based on uh, qualitative evidence, for example, but, but not yet quantitative. Um, so as an example, I'm gonna just skip ahead to show you a graph. Um, so this is um, DHS2 data. So showing um, attendance at health facilities nationally uh, for uh, deliveries. Um, so maternity, and you can see that huge um, increase from March until just leading up to May, uh, to increase in the number of, of women under 20 nationally who are delivering at um, health, health facilities. So um, the reason why I put that there and why I think it's, it's uh, fairly interesting is that this is something that in our qualitative research since the beginning of the response, so since uh april may last year we were hearing of a huge increase in the number of uh, pregnant women pregnant girls as a response to schools the result of schools being closed etc but we didn't have i mean naturally we didn't have uh data from you know, dhs2 data to to show this because we had to wait nine months to see anything um but here you've got nine months after the uh after this period of lockdown after the uh the, the, the first the first times we were, we were hearing this in um, uh, in qualitative research we've got this seen in DHS too so um, um, but if we're presenting if we're trying to convince actors to use evidence when they can't visibly see something like a graph um, so for COVID, it's a good example. Um, the broader impacts, it has been really difficult. So now, but I mean now, I mean it's uh, this week we've uh, we've used this uh, graph and a few others um, and some of our own ev evidence from uh, earlier in the um, research we did we did previously to include in um, advocacy pieces and um, uh, what do you call it grant grant proposals to actually try and push for action on this, but it's just nine months after we first started collecting data on this. So this delay is something that makes it quite a different sort of domain to work in um, COVID. Um, but yeah, just leading to this slide then, so looking at the, the broader impacts of, of COVID, so using this kind of evidence for advocacy. So these could be longer term problems that do require longer term solutions. So all of these babies being born from now will, uh, maybe they're not necessarily born to teenagers because we only have the data for under 20s and possibly the majority of the mothers here are, are 18 and above but um but if there are those which are born to girls still at school then will this lead to an increase um, of girls abandoning school um how do we support the the newborns as well um but it's difficult because often addressing these issues can, can cost more, more money. They're, they're strategic changes often as well that the organizations that, that partners will have to make. They can take more time. It can be harder to report impact as well. And, and generally they also require just more, more evidence often to convince, um, to persuade people that they need to, be, they need to be addressed and that they need to invest this money in the implementation. Um, so this is the end of the presentation almost. I know I'm quite short on time, but um, so when building a Manito, you need to address a few things. So firstly, it's going to be and very importantly, who will manage the tool? So is it going to be one person overall uh, who's overseeing the field teams and then each field team compiles a Manito to feed into the overall Manito? That's how we are doing it at the moment. Um, whether or not it is effective, uh, more effective than other uh, methods remains to be seen, but it's, it's okay for now. Um, or we have that each team might access, but might have access to the overall tool and fill it and fill it in themselves. But this relies on consistency and, and relies on everyone having complete awareness of what uh, what information goes where, what needs to be reported, etc. And it also depends on the size of the team, so the number of field sites, 
um, and if it's just one person, their general capacity to oversee the person, oversee the process. Should it be one person who's doing this full time, for example? Um, okay, and then looking at the indicators. So, what do we able, what do we want to be able to produce with the tool? Uh, do we want to group the recommendations into major themes? Um, so this again can link to uh, whether it's one or several people accessing the overall, overall Manito and making sure there's consistency and that and the, the grouping is, is done correctly. And then also looking at uh, avoiding duplication. Um, so this again is um, duplication counting if we have the same recommendation that goes in, uh, appears in the Manito several times. If this is too many people accessing the Manito, maybe it gets a bit confusing, so maybe it's better to have one person who can just have an overall insight. Um, okay, so finally, just some challenges that we have uh, faced along the way. So, um, yeah, we need to, like, we constantly need to try and push the fact that it's about the results and the action based on the results rather than the methods. So as I said before, there can often be demands for more detail on the methodology um, rather than the analysis and and how we can how we can take it forward, so we try not to take offence by that if people are uh, telling us we should have been doing something slightly differently. Um, any case, um, so yeah, we need allies as well. So again, Ebola was was uh, has been really helpful for this, and and, uh, and the response in in Butembo more recently, having people who know of us support what we do, um, and. But I think this does come with time and exposure. So obviously, you know, trust comes with, with that as well. So people are very used to research groups being just about the research, not necessarily the action. Um, and the action might be left up to them. So especially in the kind of new domains of, of, of COVID, of working in malnutrition, for example, with um, one of some of the UNICEF teams, like the CAS is still quite a new concept and especially IOA is also another, another, another new concept. And it's quite, it's quite trial and error to a degree. So we need to be quite clear at the beginning that, that um, we're operational. Um, recommendations to address unseen problems. So this is basically the things like the, the broader impacts of COVID, the kind of longer things that, that we can't, problems we can't see now, but we anticipate. So we need to advocate for things that, uh, for support that we think we will need. Um, suitability of the tool for different outbreaks. Maybe actions for COVID need to be monitored differently to, to Ebola. Um, again, remains to be seen because some of the things, you know, we're, we're, it's, an, it's an ongoing process. Um, and yeah, so at the moment, we, this is a process that we, we're work, it's a tool we're working with. It's, um, uh, we think it's effective, um, adapting as we go, any suggestions of how it can be better uh, would be great, but yeah, this is a nice space to share. Sorry, Simone, I know I've only given us 10 minutes to actually have a conversation about it, but um, I hope that was relatively informative. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks, Daisy. Um, that was great. Um, I'm just gonna let PYC Maria Emily's hand up. Go for it. Hi, super interesting, very intense um, and very dense. The great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so, I was so this is very CAS focused, right? And it's it's kind of it, it does seem well, it is uh, project management. Monito is, and Monitoto, Monitito, sorry, is, are, are project management tools, right? But that's that's how I I, I see them. Um, so how how much do you include the authorities in the you know the country and the decision makers within the country in the, those recommendations because um i'm sorry if i missed it but i didn't really hear any of that in the presentation um so when or are they at any point in, involved um and how do you make sure because this is very cast so i i understand that there's some collaborations and coordination with other partners on, uh, in the field but um how do you know that the implementation of measures are linked to whatever recommendations came out from CAS when we have you know loads of partners on the ground who not necessarily who do, do not necessarily um, collaborate with you uh, and who probably also make some some similar recommendations sometimes so without necessary and I'm, I'm, I'm being the, the advocate of the the devil one right now but who not necessarily do social science um, 
on, on top of what they do. Um, and then um, about the, I have many others, but I'm not going to ask all of them because there are other hands raised. Um, about the last graph on pregnancies, um, if you know that, you know, why, why wasn't there, why didn't you launch a survey when that was happening to anticipate uh, those pregnancies? So first of all, when we see the graph, it's super difficult to have a direct causality with whatever happened nine months ago. It could just be an artifact. It could be a bias in the, in the reporting system. It could be that maybe more women go to healthcare facilities uh, to give birth. Uh, and it's just in the, in the, I think the last two points are slight, seem to be slightly above, but it's, it seems to be it's quite you know, up and down all the time. I'm sure Thibault would, uh, be more, um, would be more professional on this kind of, of trends. But um, so why, why wasn't there a, a survey done around those, you know, those signals you had? Because we don't really need to see that you have more deliveries nine months later, because we do know that if, uh, if you do a survey and that you know that those uh, young women are getting married or having, you know, are not going to school anymore and having an activity and need to have a need to have a way of um, uh, an income and, and then get pregnant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then we know that there's going to be more deliveries in nine months. So uh, how come to prevent those pregnancies, how come, you know, and give recommend recommendations before saying, pay attention, especially UNICEF, because you're supposed to support school, right? Uh, and women. So how come you didn't have those kinds of surveys and recommendations prior to the nine months when you see, now you think that it's a link to that, that you were seeing more deliveries? Over. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna suggest we take a couple and then, so we go through. So Thibault, Eva, Chris. Sorry, do you want me to ask questions in addition to the ones that Mara Emily just asked? Or shall, shall we wait for the answer? I, I Okay, we, I was going to take a couple of questions at the same time. If you have additional questions, we'll just collect the couple of questions and we'll ask them. Uh, okay, okay. So sorry for adding to the pile. Um, okay, the first thing is, I think it's amazing. I'm not being nice. I think uh, you're way, way, way ahead of the curve in everything I've seen where modeling or, or data science is used to inform decision making in an outbreak, including what's happening in the UK or in France right now. Um, so, and I think you're at the level where like the best tech companies are for software deliveries. What you're doing is very, very, very similar to what's been done in, in the software development industry and what data science is just starting to do, but you're really ahead of the curve. So I, I think it's amazing. I think you need to publish that you know, just to say, hey, we're, we've been monitor this is how we go about trying to assess how effective our processes are. Uh, I've got tons here. So I've, I'll, a lot of them revolve around overheads of these processes. I think you need to have them. I'm not saying you're wasting time doing all of that. Uh, but, you know, it's things like getting the tours and getting all the stakeholders to agree to the tours before getting ahead and getting started with data collection process and analysis. Uh, what, in your experience, are the biggest hurdle, the biggest overhead in these processes? And what are the key factors to try and reduce them? Sorry, it's vague, but I, yeah, um, I guess that's my main question. Over. Great, thank you. Eva? Great, thanks. And uh, thanks, Sissy, uh, for that presentation. Really fantastic. And I just love as well uh, how um, CAS is always coming up with new terms like the CAS for CASI. Um, <laughs> so um, I just, uh, and I don't want to add too many questions, but I, I just uh, had a question around. Um, feedback uh, of the research results to communities um, and how this is tracked, how their uh, recommendation reactions um, and then their actions independent from um, the, 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 the public health authorities or other stakeholders in the response is, is being tracked and if there is like or if there are some thoughts around doing that. And then a second question, and we can take that uh, maybe up bilaterally um, from the collective service, the RCC collective service, 
Uh, the team is currently working on a national level m &E framework. So this is for national RCCE groups, where it's also about like um, the collection and use um, of social behavioral data, triangulating this um, with other data. And um, I was just wondering about uh, like the indicators you're using for the Monito um, and to see like to which extent that is sort of like matching with the indicators we have so far thought about. Um, also like factoring in that probably um, some like the process might be quite different uh, in terms of, you know, like formulating the research question, conducting the research that this might be more um, done independently by different partners, um, rather than following um, the great cast approach. So I'm just wondering as well how we could track then um, the sort of like evidence being reduced and how, uh, being generated and then informing decision making process. If, for example, the step of co developing um, actions is not necessarily given. That's all from my end. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Chris. Um, great. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. And uh, having worked the Ebola outbreak and saw this being stood up over time, it's really evolved. And uh, so great job, Izzy. Um, and a couple thoughts. Um, one is, you know, I do think methods matter in our data collections. Um, and I, I totally understand how focusing on methods in these short presentations can be a distraction to not getting to the use and the deliberations around action. But I do think we need to think about how to be proactive in either uh, having a, an array of TORs that have robust methods mapped out. And, and then when we're negotiating those actions, sticking, you know, not compromising on the methods front, as well as sort of um, orienting people to this is the array of methods that we'll use. These are valid. These are all that other stuff because um, that speaks to the issue of validation. In your slides, all the validation steps are more approvals and permission-seeking steps. They're not scientific validation steps where we're actually taking a step to say, is this survey instrument measuring the things that we're intending it to measure? So I think um, methods matter. And I do think um, having some steps in the process there where we're actually validating your instruments, whether it's cognitive interviews, ensuring the language is right, because in, in most places, language really does matter, and Translators Without Borders have shown that time and time and time again. So spending some time with some validation steps and adding that in there. And the last thing is, I think is a real opportunity for us as social scientists is in that notion and in those discussions with our colleagues around actions, I, I agree with you. Everyone says sensitization, let's just sensitize. And you're like, no, no, no. I think part of our jobs as social scientists is to remind them that there's a whole range of behavioral science tools that map to, you know, you think of the behavior change wheel, 93 very specific behavior change techniques mapped to nine tactical moves and seven strategic areas. If we were able to bring that science to bear and say, okay, this is what social science says, you know, if these are the drivers that we're seeing in our data, here are the tactical and strategic opportunities that can influence those drivers and then offer, offer them the array of, and I don't say we need to tell them exactly what they have, but offer them the range of appropriate evidence-based <laughs> strategies so that they don't always just go straight to sensitization. <laughs> Um, because people do go to what they're familiar with. They go to what they know. And our job is to, I think, to bring them the, the range of menu options that actually have a chance at influencing the drivers that we're seeing in our data. So just a couple of thoughts there. Thanks, Chris. And I know that Izzy has just messaged me and asked me. Um, Thanks, Jen. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna help Izzy in my speed of speaking, considering the time. Um, but Izzy, again, thanks so much for the, the presentation. So, a um, couple of things that may be helping us to be clear. So, even the CAS existence, we have terms of reference signed off by the Minister of Health, INRB, together with the Kinshasa School of Public Health, uh, and the D DGLM, so the Direction Générale de la Lutte contre la Maladie, to be involved. So, everything that we do, they will be aware. Of. So, if we do a study. At a, even at a local level, the, the Ministry of Health at country level knows. But then if Izzy goes to, so Izzy's in 
Aitori during the plague. First thing she does is go to the base they said, so the bureau chef de zone and the medicine chef de zone, and she will identify and work through the local health actors there, including the validation of the tool before data collection. Um, so that's kind of in the process of ensuring that the involvement, everybody not only knows that what we're doing, but the tools um, that are being used are being approved and done together with local health actors, um, not just the CAS team. So otherwise we, we would risk having people not want to use the data or not validate the data. That also, Chris does answer the question of like the methods. So the more people are involved in the process, the less questions are about the methods. Uh, tools in terms of, I'm jumping a little bit, but like healthcare worker survey tools that were developed in Ebola. Uh, those were developed, signed off by like all major actors, but including the Minister of Health um, and the methodology. Those then were adapted for healthcare worker survey uh, surveys in um, in COVID um, and uh, household surveys adapted in cholera, signed off by PNACAL, WHO, the GTFCC, uh, MSF, et cetera. So making sure that the different actors are involved in the tool development and in the um, methodology for data analysis before starting, especially in those uh, survey tools. And then in anything that is qualitative and adaptive in terms of that more operational, we're um, in a tour looking at the plague, adapting uh, qualitative tools, those are done very locally and signed off very locally as well. Um, so, but in terms of the involvement of local health actors, so very much BCZ, MCZ, but also what in the DRC is the CACs, so the Salut d'Action Communautaire, which answers the question about the community feedback component as well. Um, so those are not Ministry of Health, those are the community group or whatever platform at a local level. So they would be involved um, or well, we are involving them more and more in presentation of results, obviously not presenting a big PowerPoint. We're not in rooms with projectors or anything like that, but representing back the data and working with them or with uh, um, uh, uh, women who help women give midwives. Midwife. Oh my God, thank you. What, what, every English, come on, so. um, the midwife associations, right? Um, so we then work with them as well. Um, so in terms of that inclusion, uh, we have quite a lot, we don't, you know, whereas in Ebola, we did still face a lot more challenges of like having a minister of health or local health actor be like, no, 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 I'm not signing your TOR to collect data. Uh, as far as I know, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems to happen very easily. The base is ads, the MCs ads, um, that works with, because we're also working through the DGLM and through the DSO, so the direction uh, for Epidemio, uh, as well. Um, Pregnancy question. So we absolutely had every data and presented and talked about it and published a brief with all of the major actors on this coming out, uh, including every single piece of data we could collect across the country. Um, while you, family planning is not is not the thing that um, that actors are so keen on talking about. We had three workshops on the broader impacts of COVID, which brought together including DFID or FCDO and the World Bank and UNICEF and WHO and the Minister of Health and Kinshasa School of Public Health and like uh, ITM, Médecins du Monde, Marie Stopes, like bringing all these actors together to talk about it. Um, and we actually went back to the different NGOs afterwards to see even if they could get more money, like if, if Médecins du Monde or Marie Stopes was able to argue uh, for more funds to set up increased mobile clinics, increase access to family planning. Uh, and it, it, it was not, it was not done. So it's something that we are are frustrated um, and very vocal about. Um, it's also something that we have um, submitted publication for to talk about why this is an issue at, at a gendered level of why are we not investing in the thing that, that matters most even when we have all the, the data to prove it. Um, tools, community feedback, stakeholders, yes. Um, so we do have the tools, we do have an range of tools that are adapted, we, you know, we do use in vivo, we do communicate on what is the IOA process um, at the beginning. Um, Chris, absolutely about the suggesting things as well, like being very clear on like, these are some of the things that we suggest or that we demonstrate that have been done. Um, Izzy, do you want to add anything else? I'm sure I've missed questions that I'm trying to see in the chat. Um, I was just going to say something about the method, the thing about the methods again. So, Simone, I know you explained well, like how we go about 
um, making sure our methodology is is very solid. But like one of the one of the actual it's a bit of a challenge we've had lately is yeah trying to avoid basically during a presentation people asking questions about the methodology. We will, we'll always talk about it, but because it's never meant to be the main focus of the presentation, trying to trying to work out what's the what's the kind of minimum we can say while still covering the relevant points. So it's a bit trial and error at the moment with the team in the field when I'm presenting to um, to kind of see, yeah, to adapt how they're presenting and to adapt um, how much of the methodology they can kind of get away with presenting. I think with, yeah, with, with confidence and um, experience and, and exposure um, to the cast, I think when, when, um, actors are used to seeing us and they're, they're used to trusting our data and used to trusting our methodology. I think that will become a bit easier, but it's something we're working on. And if there's any suggestions of, of how we can kind of quickly not gloss over, but like cover the methodology in a way that is, is concise, but um, that tells the, tells the story whilst giving enough time for presenting evidence, that would be useful. Um, so my one extra point, I think, I'm not sure you covered with um, how we present to communities, but did you cover that? So the CAC is. Oh, you did. Sorry. Okay, I was listening. <laughs> um, and just Juliet, I think it just maybe a couple of points of what we're learning. So, for example, we work with. I don't know if Gregoire is still on the call. Um, but for example, we work with Blues. He is still on the call. I owe you an email, Gregoire. Thank you. So we have, for example, cholera household survey data on cholera. These tools. I mean, I think they're awesome. They ask all kinds of questions. We can analyze it by location, by whether you've had a caller intervention or not, um, and then over time. And the aim that we wanna do now is say, okay, so if the DSE has a page where you can look at the disease online from the Ministry of Health, and you can look at heat maps of where are outbreaks, can you not all also click and get the data from the studies? Um, so this is part of the thing of how do we set that up in ways where um, the data is more easily available um, on the same sites as the Minister of Health, on the same um, access, and that that's set up through the Minister of Health, not uh, not necessarily through CAS. Um, we have somebody who does the DHS2 analysis um, at the University of Hong Kong right now. So then we work, we're working at trying to have somebody who is Congolese in the Minister of Health who gets trained on running the interpreter time series analysis and using the codes to be able to run the same work. We are three internationals in the country, and I also work part-time outside of the country, but and the rest of the researchers are national. Um, so even the people who do our briefs are national teams. Uh, and the aim is that really then they're working, you know, we have people part of the La Lucha uh, teams, part of different uh, local civil society as well, to have it, it be reinforced in this way. Um, and that we really seek to um, do everything through uh, organization or through organizations, through the Ministry of Health structure. That sounds nice. Twice we've tried to take somebody as like a stagiaire who was provided by the INRB. Um, and once during Ebola and once during COVID. And the it was it was an absolute disaster. Um, it was it was very challenging. Um, but but we're not giving up on identifying what are the right people who can who we can make sure that those capacities and, and that that workload is handed over. Um, at DRC, you always have an outbreak, so you have an, a reason to exist. But part of Julia, I think part of the whole IOA global group and way of support is to go. Actually, you don't need a cast in every country. It's just about when you have an outbreak that we would facilitate IOA and the use of evidence, and that Manito would, or a version of Manito, or that kind of process would accompany the support that IOA would give in another country in an outbreak without having to set up a full structure. To answer all of those really quickly. Um, <laughs> any other questions or comments? No, great. Um, Can I actually, yeah, uh, so, because I, yeah. I think one question has not been answered because that's the same question, Maria Maliet, and that's how uh, the implementation of recommendations are being linked to whatever cash, whatever has been recommended, basically. Um, but um, another thing, which is a bit in my mind, which I'm not entirely clear on, because I kind of two levels, right? There is, uh, and that I think has been asked also before by um, third person asking a question, which I forgot the name of, is that, uh, so on the one hand, you have whether a recommendation is being implemented. 
On the other end, you have, uh, and I think, Izzy, that's what you showed at the beginning of the presentation. Thanks, by the way, for the comprehensive presentation. That is um, indicators from um, monitoring the process and also seeing to what extent um, things are being implemented. And what I'm not entirely sure about is how both of them um, are being measured. So what are the indicators and can we standardize them? So you have what is basically an indicator for a recommendation being implemented? Is it basically governmental response uh, that only, or are, are it other, other indicators as well? And then also for uh, whenever something is implemented, and I think that's what you showed at the beginning, Izzy, but I'm not entirely sure because that's not clear to me, is when measuring impact, um, how do you define basically these impacts? Because I saw things like whether um, CTE attendance has improved or something. And I think a couple of these things can be standardized, right? But I'm not entirely sure how you define these things and what they're, yeah, and what they're based on. So uh, I hope my question is clear, but it's kind of two levels where, and, and I'm in my head still mixing up these two levels and I hope you can clarify it for me and disentangle it. Simone, are you still there? Sorry, I got cut out. Um, yeah, Izzy, do you want to answer? Do you want me to answer? Uh, please go ahead. Um, okay, so so the indicators, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing, and this is something we could really talk about, right? Like we could think about what are particular standardized indicators and what that looks like. What we would do is we would present the results, co-develop recommendations, and agree on an indicator for that recommendation. So we say, um, okay, I'm gonna be really, really like a simple one. Uh, we present the results to the Risk Communication Commission and we say people are misunderstanding the symptoms. The, the co-developed co recommendation is to change communication materials on better symptoms. And we say, okay, who's responsible for that? By what date? And we will come back to see by that date. And so then the progress against the indicator is whether those communication materials have been adapted and by the date agreed. And the narrative part goes into what actually happened, et cetera, were they tested, were they, you know, all the steps that would be required, including they, they would actually need money uh, to do that, that UNICEF is gonna print them or that the WHO is going to print them or the Ministry of Health is going to sign off. That kind of process gets written in, but the indicator agreed is communication materials which have a more accurate depiction of symptoms. But that's not us who would propose it. That's, it's really a, a, an action and, in, and the, in, or the source of verification is that the materials exist. And so when we have the source of verification, so you, in the pre presentation, you see a little code that goes with just recommendation. And if you go on the Google Drive, each location has a folder with a code and the code matches the code in the Excel. And inside that coded, that folder with the same code is the source of verification. So if you see uh, Ebola, or, or, yeah, imagine e EBOL RCCE 001, and it matches the Excel with the same code. And the recommendation was um, to change the communication materials with symptoms that are appropriate. The source of verification in the Minito says uh, communication material, you would go into the folder online and you would see the adapted communication material and the original typically. So you can see that change. If I'm presenting results then to, so for example, here um, with the, uh, increase, uh, increase the deliveries to UNICEF chiefs of section, then the agreement is we need to request for funding for X amount of kids for the first thousand days. And this is what the strategy will look like. And the result, the indicator is successful funding. And they agree on the saying, okay, we need X amount of money. The result is that they have received the money. But then the indicator is one is, I mean, whatever, a photo of the, the donor, proposal or the donor grant or whatever, and that that would get stored as well. Um, or for example, Izzy did a, a nutrition study in Tanganyika. And so the aim was to have, uh, so we presented the results and a lot of it was about women's, the, the gender dimensions of malnutrition. So there were very concrete recommendations like uh, access to bicycles for, for, for women to better, you know, better get water, get better get to work, better get to healthcare facilities. So the indicator is that women have actually been receiving bicycles. Then another action was also that there's a new strategy developed in the long term with funding for four years 
to address the gendered aspects of malnutrition. And that's a like $7 million project. So there's, and then the indicator is that we actually did the project and we would get started. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but I guess uh, but when, when you, uh, yeah, no, it makes sense. But, and I don't want to take up much more time. So I think we should have a more detailed discussion maybe another time. Uh, but I think it is uh, good to also, uh, in, in the, for example, the statistics you've been showing, are you making a distinction between recommendations which are more kind of internal? Uh, are they being in, is it uh, have the in indicators which are related to internal follow up uh, being have they been successful or is it external yeah. and are you making a distinction yeah. in the, those things that you're showing and but these things uh, we can discuss in more detail I think uh, yeah but absolutely it's important to see this is what is you were showing like the ones there's some that are that it's like how come all of these ones are advocacy based indicator so you can you can code a type of rec recommendation right so is a recommendation like an activity or is the recommendation like a strategy change or is it a funding and to be able to analyze sorry um to be able to analyze the recommendations by the type by the type of recommendation if it was like a funding versus an activity and what makes it more which ones are the ones that work better? And so for example, I can tell you. Sorry, I'm I'm losing my my connection very well. Um, but yeah, so happy happy to follow that up as well. Thibaut, did you have one more question? Go ahead. I need to no, yeah, you were breaking up. Sorry, I didn't get to everything you, you said. No, I, I would just like to second what Esther was saying about, uh, I, I think that's the crux of the problem, like knowing how you quantify that feedback. Uh, and it's, you know, I guess whether or not things, uh, results led to operational changes and timeliness, I think is also another metric. Uh, how long before it actually leads to something uh but yeah it would be great to have i think it it's it, we can fill up a, a, a full brainstorming slash meeting session on that so if there is an one on that I, i'd be very keen to be part of it because we've been wondering the same thing about you know for covid analytics and other problems and i think once we nail that one uh, that's a good thing to do yeah agree and i mean it's really like i mean i'll say this and and izzy i mean is he just runs it right like as in, in addition to analyzing data in addition to supervising teams and everything else and so I think it is something that if we had had also in Ebola we had a Manito support for the response and a Manito support in four different field locations and and now we have five public health response types of studies that we have going on across the country and one Izzy so, so yeah <laughs> But we're very grateful for that, Izzy. Thanks, Ryan. Um, okay, so thanks so much for the diehards who stayed online. Um, definitely taking note of the Maya Lee as well, the Sphere and the getting away from Excel. Gregoire, I know he left, but we're also working with him on how to get things better linked to the SG um, constantly. Uh, any other questions, comments? Obviously, this is saved, it's online. We'll send out the presentation. Um, and, and thanks, guys. Thanks, Izzy. Thanks a lot. Thanks, 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 Th